All right, guys, we're here at AMOG 2024, and Aeon 3D brought their high lows. We're going to jump right in for another deep dive look with Nick Parker, one of the head engineers on the project. Nick, how's it going today? Hey, good to see you, man. So super happy that you guys were able to bring this and show it off. Yeah, man. But really when it comes down to it, what we want to know, what we need to know is why would you get something like this over the previous industry standards of something like the Fortis or something like these big high temp machines? What makes the Hilo unique and different from all these other high temp chamber machines? Yeah, why would you buy Hilo? I mean, it depends who you are. If you're just trying to make jigs, fixtures, you're chasing reasonably easy printing in high performance materials that are going to be able to meet your use case. This is the first open market high temp machine that you're actually going to like. It's not going to drive you crazy. It's more or less just going to work at the touch of a button. We've got a thermal simulation. Even if you're trying to do Ultim, you're trying to do high performance materials that are usually going to be a very high skill thing. You know, we hire a lot of PhDs. It'll mostly just work. And then at the other end of the scale, if you've got genuine cutting edge problems, if you're trying to certify parts for flight, if you've got novel plastics, if you're trying to do the crazy stuff and you, you know, you consider yourself a leader, this thing's got every sensor you could possibly want. It's crazy repeatable, super deterministic, and it's pretty much the best possible R&D platform. Nice. Yeah, we definitely can relate to the, uh, you know, the high temp materials are generally very, very challenging. On open systems you're dealing with, you've got temperatures, but all those geometries and everything are going to be different and behave differently. So a lot of it's on the software side. Can you tell me a little about how you make this easier with all the new software and AI and whatnot behind it? Yeah, sure. So a lot of the easiness is just, hey, there's nice workflows on here. You can see some of the buttons. They play nice. Yep. But where we really shine is we've got a thermal simulation that's actually running through your part about a quarter second at a time, about a quarter millimeter at a time, and it's pretending to deposit every tiny little fleck of plastic and then simulating over the full print duration, hey, how hot is each of those little drops gonna be? So that matters because when you come back and put another bead on top, if the previous layer's gotten too cold, it's gonna be beautiful. It'll look like a nice part, but it'll fail at right. half your expected strength. Right. And then also, if you're going to overheat, we'll catch that too. But overheating doesn't scare me that much. You can see, worst case, you waste some plastic overheating. Right. Underheating, you're going to like crash a plant. Right. And then on the other side of it, once you've got a beautiful plan from our thermal simulation, this machine will do a beautiful job executing it, and it'll tell you if it manages to mess up. Right. So if you've got a tiny right. fleck of plastic yeah. in there, if you gave right. us some junk material that's undersized and the diameter sensor somehow misses yep. it, if anything goes wrong, those sensors are going to light it up like a gunshot wound. So one of the big things is the, the not only the simulation, so you, you know where the part might mess up based mm -hmm. on machine learning data from thousands and thousands of prints, but during the process, it's using all the sensors to record what happens and what happened so you can yeah. see how hot it actually was. One of the big things we see on the open systems is like Ultim 1010 will blob up on the nozzle and it'll deposit that blob somewhere on the part and mm -hmm. then it's jumping it. But if you're gone, you let it print overnight, you might not even see that. It might be mm -hmm. internal, it might be in the infill. So with the full sensor gamut throughout the process that's recording, mm -hmm. you can actually detect that. Yeah. Is, why so. is that important and who's that important for? Yeah. It's important for, I mean, really anybody. If you're just trying to learn how to run the machine, yeah. this is sort of the benefit of force sensing that people don't think about. We're all very good at 3D printing. We know how to look at this chunk of plastic and say, oh, exactly X, Y, and Z went wrong with that. I know how to fix that. Off I go back to the slicer, easy peasy. If you just bought a new machine, you just joined a company, you're growing fast, this beautiful Hilo is treating you very well, you've bought more, your poor operator does not know how to read the tea leaves in a chunk of Ulta. Yeah, yeah. And so the force sensor data says, oh, hey, look, your first layer is a little bit over extruded, like, oh, you might have let that hydrate a little bit. So it really cuts that learning curve. Yeah. But then where it really, really shines is, like I said earlier, if you're trying to do certified aerospace, if you're trying to do anything with any criticality, if you care if your parts are strong, then you want four sensors on there to tell you if they come, came out right. So what, what type of anomalies during the print and defects can you detect with this tech? Yeah. So. There's a lot of boring ones. We've got uh, sensors down in the feed assists in the material management drawer okay. that'll tell you, hey, are you giving it enough plastic? It'll me measure the diameter of everything coming through and compensate that. Okay. There's tension compression sensors. But what we're really excited about is force monitoring and the simulation. So the two scariest things, if you've got a critical use case, are cold welds and debris inclusion. 
Cold welds, you have a part that looks totally fine, comes off the machine, maybe prettier than your average part, but because some section of it got a little bit too cold before that next layer came by, it's just crazy weak. We're talking right. half of your rated strength. You put that into use, it's gonna break, and you know, maybe you just print it on a cold Tuesday, so most of your parts are fine. You're in a serial production context, you're gonna get bit. Yeah. And then the other scary one is debris inclusion. So you have a little bit of something depositing on the nozzle, you uh, asked it to do some crazy support structures, that didn't quite work out, but the part's kind of fine, so you know, comes out looking sensible, but you don't know, deep inside of that part, in your most important load path, there's a big chunk of trash. Big old air voids around that chunk of trash. Yep. And again, you're gonna fail at half your rate and strength. Yeah, that's one of the biggest things, is you know, everybody's like, oh yeah, 3D prints aren't strong in the Z-axis yeah. adhesion. It's like, well, this massively increases this. Yep. Well, it, it, with the simulations and everything, how close to, well, not isotropic strength, but how close to the full strength in the Z layers are we achieving? Depends what material, 70-ish percent. And consistently. Depends, yeah, that's where I was about to go, is yes. consistently. Right. Because, I mean, if you're a competent engineer, you can say, okay, cool, I've got this strength in X and Y, that strength minus 0.3 in Z, and you can design around that, that's all fine. The reason people don't fly FDM parts, the reason people don't trust FDM parts, is because the error bounds are way the hell too big. And so that's what I was saying earlier with determinism. This thing's got a ton of work put into it to make sure that you've got super accurate positioning, even at 250 Celsius. Your bed's still dead flat. Your bed mesh is still absolutely beautiful. So that you can say, okay, hey, if I make 50 of these on different high lows, on different bases around the world, they're all gonna be within some reasonable percentage of each other, and I can have a safety factor that's, you know, a normal safety factor, not like two digits. Should we take a quick look inside? Anything you wanna show? Chamber flow is pretty obvious. Everybody that knows what they're doing does a bit of a whirlpool setup. So you've got outlet inlet on one side, inlet outlet on the other. That gives you this nice turbulent mixture in there, which turbulence sounds bad, but it lets you stay uniform as you print different parts. If you try to do a perfect laminar thing, you've got beautiful flow for one tensile coupon, but you put <laughs> anything real in there yeah. and you're gonna have hot spots and cold spots. You're not gonna know what's happening. Right. It's gonna be super sensitive to tiny deviations. Uh, if we look in the back here, we've got something we're pretty proud of. This is the purge and inspection drawer. So that clicks out, toolless removal. That's brushes that the, the uh, machine can come and wipe off on. You can purge material, drop it in here with a little flicker. When the drawer goes back in, that flicks open. Your pellet of uh, purge material falls down a pipe to the back of the material drawer. That sounds very simple, but notice this is outside the heated environment. Almost every other high temp system will just give you a bucket in the oven. The bucket works great. One day you forget to empty the bucket, now you need a new bucket. There'll be two 4K cameras, one in each in production. The other third of that drawer is another camera that's a microscope bounced off of a mirror. So the microscope hides in the back, stays nice and safe even at 250C. And that lets you get, I wanna say six micron pixel picks, pixel pitch yeah. uh, images inside uh, at the tip of the nozzle. So I don't know if you've ever done XY offset, well, you have. I don't know if you, the viewer, have ever done XY offsets yeah, yeah. on a high temperature machine. It is not fun. You print some nonsense, takes like an hour. On this machine, it's about two minutes. Each, each nozzle just comes over, gets a little selfie taken. The software compares the two of them and off you go. Yeah, yeah. Simple solutions that are highly effective. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, if you're just trying to get good parts in high temp materials, you will actually like this machine. Right. And I don't think anything else on the yeah. open market can say that. So it's kind of like this eliminates a lot of the, okay, we're gonna print it 16 times until we figure out the exact way, and then we can do it for the most part consistently. This is like, eliminates a lot of that guessing and checking with the AI and machine learning, mm -hmm. and just with the general workflow of it. Uh, that's awesome. What kind of build plates are you using? Uh, this one's CF Peak. We really love it when we can get away with it. It's uh, carbon fiber is magical. It shrinks when it gets hot. It really, really likes to let go of your part when it cools off. Yeah. Super easy. Some materials don't like that. So this is a vacuum chuck. If you need to put something special on there for the pickier plastics, super easy. All right. So you know, one of the, one of the huge things in uh, in the industry right now. We can go check this is print speeds. You see people taking any kind of you know, core XY machine, they're like, oh look, I'm going 1500 millimeters a second. And then you've got some companies that went super fast, but it physically doesn't necessarily make sense. You're flinging material everywhere. How fast can you reliably print on this machine? Mm -hmm. And depending on the material, of course. Depending on material. Okay. But yep. so, this little guy is a high-low hot end. If you're watching this on YouTube, you probably know Vez 3D and the guts of this thing are very, very similar to a Goliath, except integrated for high temperature. So this outer tube here is INVAR, that's a structural system that 
allows it to be dead stable as you heat it up. So the heater core in there gets one 1.2 millimeters longer when you send it to 450C. The Invar outer tube doesn't change at all, so your nozzle stays in the same place. On the tip here, you have a nonstick shield with tiny little holes in it for uh, compressed air part cooling. Part cooling isn't super often something that you use in high temp land, but if you've got a thermal simulation, then you can say, all right, I'm gonna hug the hot side of my processing window. I am never, ever, ever gonna have a joint that gets too cold. And for the four or five spots that the simulation tells me you're gonna get too hot, I'm just gonna blast them with air. Okay. Uh, you were asking about print speeds when I yep. pulled this thing out. So 100 cubic millimeters a second in PETG and other commodity materials. 30, 40 in Altum, depends on your bravery for peak. Yeah, I like that answer because it's cubic <laughs> volume. Cubic millimeters per second, yeah. I, right, as opposed to, the gantry, oh, 500 millimeters a second. The gantry will rip 600 at 1G. Right. Um, yeah. But that's, you know, you put a junky nozzle on that, that's not gonna right. do anything. Right. Oh, uh, speaking of non-junky nozzles, that's tungsten carbide. That means very good thermals, very good heat transfer, and extremely good never abrasion gonna resistance. Wear out. And never gonna wear out. Yeah, exactly. So you can run all the carbon fiber composites, glass fibers, nanotubes, whatever you're running through this machine, you can pretty uh, much do it. Uh, another cute detail on here. Uh, these little guys right here, so it takes two screws to secure this. One that goes in that groove, one that secures a pair of heat pipes onto this side of the uh, heat sink. So there's no water cooling in this system and we're not dumping gallons and gallons of compressed air to keep the cold side of your uh, heat break cold. All we do is we have effectively a CPU heat sink reaching up into the cold plenum here Normal fan, works like a million bucks. They were printing Ultim 9085 live at the show. That's something you don't always see. So, and that was successful. Do we have that part here? Let me actually. Yeah, so actually, this is a good segue. This part got uh, bit by the trade show curse. So there's oh, of a course. <laughs> great big chunk of debris in here. Uh, Very unfortunate. However, it's an accidental demo because over here you've got the force data. Yep. And let's, there's let's check this out. Bring this bright in. red gunshot wound where you have the debris inclusion. So yeah, literally right here, we can see that defect that's in the part. So all that debris in there, and that's, that's what you'll see on a lot of machines. And you can see it right in there on the actual recording of data. What yep. Do you, what do you call it? Uh, tool force sensor, yeah. The tool force sensor, sensor history map. So I mean, in action, yes, it failed. On the show floor, it had an issue where this would not be flight ready, and it detected it. And that's just, I mean, that's a perfect example mm -hmm. of, hey, look, this works, you'll know. Whereas that could have been hidden, then you throw this up somewhere. And then it... um, you were asking other stuff to brag. There's one thing my marketing guy doesn't think is cool. The engineers okay. on YouTube will. All right. If you look at this machine, the entire structural loop minus yes. the heated bed itself yes. is cold. So that's called a athermal structural loop. And the point of that is that this thing gets to 250 Celsius in about an hour. On any other high temp machine, you're going to wait about two more hours after that for the structure to finish thermally expanding. Here, you just press print. As soon as it's hot, off you go. That is really great. You know, heat soaking is one of those things where a new person mm -hmm. go in, they turn it on, hey, I started a printing and it's all messed up. It's like, did you let it heat up? Well, yeah. how long do I get? Well, which machine is it? How big is it? How much metal are you really soaking? How cold is it in the yep. shop? You know, versus this thing, self-contained. What oh. was what's that? That, hissing that little noise, noise right there yeah. is the purge from the compressed air dryer. So this drawer down here stays at a dew point of minus 25 at all times. If you put just about any polymer in there, it'll stay dry indefinitely. If you put low temp stuff in there, it'll get dry after a couple days. That little hiss you hear right now is air coming through a regenerative desiccant system that's got all the moisture sucked out of it at 75 to 90 PSI. And then you expand it to atmospheric pressure so it gets seven times drier from there. So uh, yeah, works like a million bucks. I love it. Sips not all that much compressed air. If you don't have compressed air in your shop, you can buy a dental compressor. It's dead silent, not, not gonna give you any trouble. Awesome, Nick, thank you so much. That's yep. Nick Parker, Director of Product. Now, if you have questions or you want more information or a one-on-one -on -one presentation on the Hilo, then we're here to help. Shoot us an email or give us a call. We're here to answer your questions and consult you and find out if this is the right machine for your business. And definitely act quick because they're going fast and manufacturing allocations are filling up faster than any other machine I've seen. Yes. So definitely do it quick. Thanks so much for watching. Have a positive rest of your day. See you on the next video.